Paul, thank you very much for that kind introduction. And uh, yes, Osnaka, and that's uh, ore samples normalised to average crustal abundance, if you are wondering. It's an open source project hosted at the University of Western Australia where we are getting as much ore grade material from any mine metallic enrichment uh, in the world. So orogenic gold deposits, porphyry copper, IOCG, magmatic nickel copper, doesn't matter. We want to analyse run of the mine uh, material to fingerprint the geochemistry of ores from all over the world. Um, we recently appealed for some more sponsorship. Uh, the project began in 2011 and uh, with $70,000 contributed by industry and that got us a thousand samples uh, analysed at Vera Veritas Ultra Trace at a, at a greatly discounted uh, rate. Uh, just last year we could see that the funds were starting to run low and so we appealed for another $70,000 and we're most of the way there thanks to the very generous support uh, of all the, the organisations that, that you see up there. So it, it seems to be a sustainable way of conducting research and the appealing thing is that all of the funds go directly uh, to the analyses. There's a website hosted at CET where you can download the data, uh, all the analyses and all the, the metadata about the samples. And also at UWA there are uh, lots of big steel drawers with the reference material in there. And if you're especially interested and you want to do something else like lead isotopes or further analytical work, the pulps are available too. That's our maiden publication in, in ore geology reviews. What I was wanting to do was uh, create a number space where we could express all of the variation in nature for metallic enrichments. And this paper really can be uh, condensed into this diagram here, which is uh, something which we'll be returning to uh, later on in the talk. It's a 3D model which is a simplification of magmatohydrothermal space and magmatohydrothermal space is just uh, a multi-dimensional space defined by your ore and uh, ore associated elements. We've simplified that down to the most important three dimensions and made a three-dimensional model. We're now up over a thousand uh, analyses We've got uh, 990 uh, odd analyses within the OSNACA project and CSIRO conducted a research project under Michael Gasly where a further 60 or 70 uh, from the Cloncurry uh, district were analysed by exactly the same protocol. So they, they fit uh, perfectly within the OSNACA database. But you can see that we can't go to the literature and start getting data because that would be incompatible with our data because it's all been analysed for a broad element suite. Oh, here's showing a detail of Australia. A broad element suite, 65 elements uh, by fire assay, aqua regia, four acid and peroxide fusion. We want to have a perfectly consistent data set by way of elements analysed, detection limits, an analytical method. What I'm going to be talking about today is shown up there on this big poster and that big poster there is 871 ore grade samples that have been selected out of uh, the, the thousand odd uh, samples. Now of course we're not uh, putting the standards or the, the duplicates in there we also exclude pegmatites and iron ore samples. There's a few partially weathered samples which slip through the net because we are focused purely on hypergene samples. The geochemical variation that we're looking at, we only want to be uh, in the hypergene uh, environment. Uh, but by far the most samples which have been culled are low grade particularly orogenic gold samples where we're given a sample, yeah this is from such and such a mine, I think it's uh, got some gold in it and it doesn't have very much gold. So I just did a, a simple uh, cut off 
if a sample didn't have at least 0.2 grams per tonne gold or at least 0.2 grams per tonne platinum, etc., etc. These are fairly modest cutoffs, and if a sample fails to uh, jump over at least one of these hurdles, it, it's been excluded. But that leaves us with 871 samples, and they've been uh, classed, uh, and this is according to uh, the description given by the, the donor of the samples into the, the major uh, ore deposit classes. So you can see that uh, we've got uh, orogenic gold, over 200 samples, and around 100 IOCG, VMS and epithermal, but then it starts to thin out. We're down to 60 for, for MVT and so on. And the biggest hole in the uh, Osnaka project remains porphyry copper samples. We're, we're really keen on getting more porphyry copper material to analyse. So those 871 samples, uh, we've applied the Osnaka transform, which I'm going to describe to you in the next few slides. And that diagram there is really, it, it is a similarity matrix. It's the distance in the Osnaka mathematical space that each sample lies from every other sample. And what you notice is that there are groupings of colour. I haven't just arranged this in alphabetical order. It's been arranged according to uh, a hierarchical clustering routine. So the areas of hot colour are samples which are geochemically similar according to the Osnaka transform. Well, we're going to explore this diagram in the second half of, of the talk but I hope everybody can imagine, even if they can't see from that distance, 871 samples this way by 871 that way, and the diagonal, of course, is zero distance when you compare the sample to it itself. All right. This is what inspired me to go out to industry and set up the Osnaka project. In the literature, there's a multitude of multi-element ore signatures and they've been well recognised and they're very useful when they're described qualitatively, but they're names like John or Phil. And how do you describe how similar John and Phil are? How do you describe how similar a sample with a gold arsenic antimony tungsten enrichment is? to a different type of orogenic gold mineralisation. And so the problem goes. We see these lists like, or these lists of elements that describe the signature of uh, the mineralisation, but we don't have a quantitative framework of comparing them. So how can these differences and similarities be quantified? What the challenge really comes down to is, can you separate out a number space that ideally separates out lithological variation from the variation owing to mineralisation in that data, and also levels the data, because a signature tell, is not dependent on grade. So we're wanting something uh, which puts two samples with the same ore element ratios, but different element abundances close together in this number space. So I always pause at this point and say this is not the way to do it and I invite smarter people than me to have a think about this problem and improve upon it. But this is exactly the method that's described in the, in the Ore Geology Reviews paper. Okay, the first thing to do is to censor the data and this is the part where we're trying to remove as much of the lithological variation as we can. And what that means is that you're replacing any value below average crustal abundance with the average crustal abundance. So there's a flaw, if you like. The traditional flaw is half the lower limit of detection, but we're wanting to raise that flaw and cut out a lot of the variation owing to lithology. Normalise the data to average crustal abundance simply means divide by the average crustal abundance value. So if you're following me, you can see that we, you can't get a value less than one. And then if we log the data, and I'll explain with care in a minute, you can't get a value less than zero. So on a normal log-log plot, you have four quadrants, and three of them involve negative values. But what we're doing is we're setting the origin at average crustal abundance, and the, uh, 
the element enrichment, what we're interested in is the direction that we're enriched above average crustal abundance. And that's why we're only dealing in this positive uh, quadrant uh, of our mathematical space. So we've simplified it here to two dimensions, but the maths can be ex expanded to as many dimensions as you, as you like. Now, we still haven't solved the problem of uh, rich samples versus poor samples, and that's the last step of the Osnaka transform is to scale the data so it's all moved to a fixed distance, 10 units from the origin. And now at last, if we measure the distance, and that's as simple as Pythagoras' theorem, it's just the uh, square root of the long side of the triangle, except it's a 24-dimensional <laughs> triangle, it's a Euclidean distance. And if that distance is small, those samples are geochemically similar. If that distance is large, they're quite different. All right, we talked about uh, censoring the data. Is that important? Because you think, well, look, we've got lead at uh, 100,000 ppm, 10% lead, and even higher. What does it matter what's going on below 11 ppm lead, which is the average crustal abundance? Well, the trouble is, once you log the data, you stretch the axes in a way that makes the low variation at the lower end of uh, the scale, just as important as variation at the upper end of the scale. And you can see that here, that on uh, a log-log plot of iron versus zinc, that there's even more variation below the average crustal abundance of iron at 5.1% than there is above, and that's because of closure. You can't go above 100% iron. Uh, but you can also see that there's significant variation for zinc, for nickel, and for copper, and for many of our, uh, our ore-associated or truly ore elements. But by clipping that out, we're only dealing with the variation above average crustal abundance. And think about what we're trying to define. Ore element signatures are substantial uh, enrichments. We're not talking about things around average crustal abundance. Now, I mentioned log the data with care. This is uh, two slides, one showing if we use a base 10 log for everything, we get these curves from, or well, here's uh, one part per million through to a million parts per million, 100%, and we get these log scores of one, two, all the way up to, to nine. Well, that, that's fair enough, and that was the, the way I, I started when I wanted to build the model. But the trouble is, for an an element like iron, the zero point is at average crustal abundance, 5.1%. Uh, a log score of one is 51% iron. A log score of two requires 510% iron. So you see the problem. Iron can't uh, express itself properly using that transform. So all I've done is for any element which has an average crustal abundance more than one ppm, I've adjusted the base of the log. So iron goes through steps one, two, three, four, five, six uh, on a much steeper trajectory from 5.1% up to 100%. I realise that's a bit convoluted. Perhaps an easier way to do it is look at those 24 uh, elements. The zero value is, of course, average crustal abundance. And then we go in steps uh, from zero through to six, uh, and we end up at 100% for these uh, more abundant elements, whereas something like gold just goes in steps of 10 times all the way through to 1300 ppm. The point I want to make here is that there is no universal ore grade value for any element. However, this is a reasonable uh, benchmark, if you like, uh, which, with which we can compare all of the different elements. So a score of three is half a percent uh, cobalt, 0.7 percent nickel, uh, half a percent copper, nearly a percent zinc, nearly uh, a third of a percent lead. So anomalous to approaching ore grade. If we go up to a score of five, 61 percent is direct shipping iron ore, 
20% nickel, 17% copper, 20% zinc, 130 grams gold. These are all recognised as really good to bonanza type grade. So it's a framework that's about right where we can reasonably compare an enrichment of any uh, of one element against any other. And this framework is close to magnetohydrothermal space. And I say close to because we haven't scaled it yet. That's only after step three. And the other thing is that the method has been refined. Because just using average crustal abundance is a fairly crude flaw, if you like. And it was particularly the orogenic gold samples hosted in ultramafic rocks with 1,000 ppm nickel, which were causing us some concern. So I um, thought about that a bit and thought, well, hang on, we can improve on that. And so I'm showing you here the most uh, important uh, adjustment to the transform. There's a few other, but the one that really counts is, is nickel. And what we do is we model the expected value of nickel according to chrome that's owing to lithology. So if, it's, if nickel is less than 59 ppm, no problem. That's just the original Osnacker transform. If the, value of, if the actual value of nickel is less than the modelled value of nickel, it sits in here underneath our new floor and it also gets replaced by the average crustal abundance. And that curve there is just a simple power function uh, of chrome. Here we just use our original technique that we use the uh, nickel ppm value. And here uh, we replace with nickel, the actual nickel value minus the modelled nickel value plus 59. Essentially what we're doing is we're calculating the residual value above this curve. And given that this is a log scale, it's hardly affecting these truly nickel mineralised samples, but it's really cutting out the false anomalism of these orogenic gold samples. So I've done similar things for iron and cobalt using scandium to model their uh, composition, and for lead and lanthanum using thorium to model their composition. But in truth, it really is the nickel that counts. So here is the refined model, and so we see uh, multi-dimensional scaling axis one and two, so these are the two most important variations, and principal component three, we see the nickel sticking up high above the, the rest of the field on here. But what we see on the original Osnacker model are these bubbles of <laughs> orogenic sticking up above, getting up higher towards nickel where they really shouldn't be. And so the refined model has, has cut out this uh, false, you know, it's, it's not a mineralisation signature, it's a lithological signature, and similarly it's, it's got rid of some of the felsic signatures down here. Other than that, the models are very similar. So that's where we uh, exit PowerPoint just for a moment. I just wanted to show you this actually moving in, uh, in LeapFrog. So this is looking down on the model. So the two most important uh, axes are multidimensional scaling one. Just think of it as principal component one. They're, they're quite similar. You just get a bit better result with the multidimensional scaling axis. And that variation is from positive values where you have uh, your copper rich and gold rich samples through to negative values where you have uh, more zinc lead zinc rich mineralisation. So we had the labels uh, in the PowerPoint slide, but this is a, a cluster of MVT samples overlapping with uh, shale hosted massive sulphide and then the purple is uh, VMS. And that's one of the really important uh, axes is uh, from zinc to copper gold. We've got the nickel sticking up towards us uh, here and IOCG in brown at the back and then gold, orogenic gold here. Epithermal is very interesting in that you've got epithermal overlapping with orogenic gold. 
You've got epithermal overlapping with zinc-rich mineralisation and also overlapping with porphyry copper. And that uh, tallies with what we know about the different flavours of epithermal mineralisation. So what I'll do is I'll just uh, tilt the, the model 90 degrees so that now we can see most of the mineralisation lines up along what we call the, the main hydrothermal plane. That's where most of our samples are. Down below we've got uh, uh, the nickel copper and up above we've got uh, tin tungsten and if I just turn this around a bit we'll see some porphyry moly mineralisation there as well. That was a bit violent. But we can and I'll be putting this model up on the OSNACA website uh, in, a, in a couple of days time. Well I've actually given it already to, to UWA. It should be up on the website in a couple of days time. And, and you can explore it. So uh, maybe our interest uh, is in the, the orogenic gold sample. So what we could do is we could uh, turn off all the shells and just put on the orogenic gold and Right, I've also put intrusion hosted gold. So now we can look at just a subset uh, of the data. We could look down on the model again. And explore different parts of it. So we might be curious, well what are these ones that are sticking out here on their own? So we just uh, turn off the shell and we can see that we've got uh, Kidston, Nolan, Sarsfield, Hadley Castle are all from northeast Queensland and then other samples from different parts of the world. And we can just rotate that around to see in three dimensions how close that cluster really is uh, to any other. Um, it's a bit clunky to do an on-screen uh, demonstration like that here, but I just wanted you to see how the model behaves in 3D. And we'll just look at these different flavours of mineralisation on that 871 by 871 matrix, piece by piece. So that's the, the summary diagram down in the bottom left hand corner. And we can really, simply, it, it really does line up into some very uh, neat chunks. We've got uh, our zinc lead in the, whoops. We've got our zinc lead in the top left hand corner and within that there are sub uh, populations which we'll, we'll look at in a minute. Then we've got copper, tin tungsten and more copper, nickel and gold. You'll notice that there is some colour that's not close to the diagonal and what we have here are some copper gold and zinc gold mineralisation in the, in the gold field. So you're not going to get a perfect separation but this is uh, quite a good uh, breakdown of the, the different uh, geochemical flavours and where something is close to something a long distance away on the diagram you can see that by looking for colour out in these regions of the grass but mostly it's white. Alright, let's zoom in on zinc lead. So we've got populations A, through to F and I've broken F down into F1, 2 and 3. So if we start with A and B, here's an example of the variation within A and that's an important point when, when we get rid of these big diagrams and go back to this matrix. Study the colour. Some of the boxes have really nice bright colour which means that you've got uh, a, a really nicely tightly constrained group and others don't have much colour in them at all, meaning that uh, you've got quite a lot more variation in your geochemical signature. But what we're looking at here are those 24 elements and their Osnaka transform enrichments from 1 all the way up, up to 6. And we can see that we're dealing with uh, some lead zinc rich VMS mineralisation. 
Next, I'm going to compare population A to population B, and the really big difference is that population A has much more tin and indium in it compared to the other zinc-rich population of VMS mineralisation. So that's an interesting finding in itself. And if we go back to the, the main diagram, we see that yeah, you know, you could break A down further into this block here, and uh, there's still quite a lot of similarity between uh, B and A, but overall it's a helpful division and it would be up to you to uh, study the finer scale divisions if you wanted to. We can see that there's a lot of fairly similar samples grouped down here as F. What are they? Well, they're mostly our sediment hosted uh, base metal deposits. So we've got shale hosted massive sulphide, MVTs and another population of MVT. And if we look at the average profiles for F1, F2 and F3, we see a progressive decrease in your penalty elements basically. Arsenic, antimony, mercury decrease as you go from 1 to 2 to 3. But unfortunately silver drops as well. But what we're really saying is that uh, we, we're tracking uh, what we kind of know already about base uh, sediment hosted base metal deposits is that there is this transition from a, a dirtier style uh, of mineralisation to uh, a cleaner style with the cleanest MVTs. We can look at copper. So now we've got uh, a different set uh, of the diagram. We can start with population G and we're dealing with uh, mostly uh, VHMS, but there's also uh, Rennes and Bell and other tin deposits. So we're getting really some quite high tin enrichments in here uh, as well. We'll skip along to I. Now we see that I does not have a lot of bright colour in it, so we're going to have quite a scattered population here. But it has captured a lot of tin tungsten mineralisation. So they're all coloured black. There's just one uh, VMS and a porphyry tin mineralisation. But what really unites this clan is the high tin and or tungsten. And the next one is no surprise, it's pulled out most of the, the molybdenum rich mineralisation. There's three IOCGs, unfortunately, oops, we can't see the colour so clearly, but there's, there's three IOCG samples here and two of those are Merlin from the uh, Cloncurry district, uh, which you know pretty well have a, a fairly uh, similar signature to a lot of other molybdenum mineralisation. And then we get back into copper. So this group K is very large and it's a lot of IOCG. There are some things that are not IOCG like uh, de Grusser and other very copper rich uh, VMS uh, mineralisation uh, and, and others. But what I really wanted to show you was that if we look at K and L but just the average profile What's different about L is it's only IOCG and it's the IOCGs that have uranium and lanthanum in their signature. So we're dealing with Olympic Dam, Prominent Hill, Ernest Henry and so on. We move further on and we get to group M which is more porphyry copper than anything else. The, the, the light green type there is sediment hosted copper but it's an unusual group of sediment hosted copper, uh, Sentinel, Canshansi, which have molybdenum and gold in them and I would argue really are unlikely to be true stratiform sediment hosted copper deposits anyway. And then finally group N, we get mostly uh, stratiform uh, sediment hosted copper deposits. So the point there is that we uh, broken down copper mineralisation into broadly uh, understandable groups. In the nickel space, I've just used the average profiles here. There's only one sample in, oops, in group O, which is uh, the Marensky Reef, one sample of Marensky Reef, shown there in brown with very high platinum and palladium. But the major division here within the nickel samples 
is those uh, in group P have low iron, so low sulphides, compared to uh, group Q, which is your classic higher sulphides. So I apologise if you can't read the uh, names of all these different uh, deposits, but the poster is also uh, going to be available on, on the website. And lastly, gold. So gold's a bloody big group, of course. If we just look at the averaged profile, there's a hell of a lot of variation going on in there. So we're going to need to simplify that. Let's just look at groups R, S and T. And what we're dealing with here, group R is epithermal mineralisation which has particularly high zinc, hence that overlap with the VMS and other zinc rich mineralisation higher up in the graph. Group S is epithermal that's particularly enriched in copper, so that's this, the high value here. And U is only a few samples from Whitwaters Rand with a completely different signature. And we can see that in that top left hand corner. Further on, we move from the more oxidised gold uh, mineralisation signature to a more reduced uh, signature. And suddenly we see a hell of a lot more arsenic and antimony uh, in uh, our profiles. Group Y is particularly interesting. It's golden mile uh, and a few other choice deposits. And what's interesting about it is that uh, it has quite high arsenic and antimony, not as high as the truly reduced deposits, but it also has uh, higher moly and uh, tellurium from the oxidised end of the spectrum and bismuth. So it's, uh, it's a mixture of, of those two signals and perhaps in orogenic gold space that might be something to look for. Right, how much time do I have left Paul? You are 36 minutes in. Yeah, I'll just whip through this quickly. This is great fun and it does give uh, an insight into the geochemistry of uh, hydrothermal ore deposits that could be applied to industry and on rare occasions at CSI Global people have asked where does this sample uh, fit into your magmatic hydrothermal space. But I think the direction that's going to be really more useful for industry is to take this transform and apply it to thousands of samples within one deposit. Because if you think about it, what we are doing when we domain our ore deposit in a gold deposit, typically all we look at is gold. But there's a, a wealth of information in the ore element signatures there, which is not being processed and we could learn a lot about our deposits and the geometallurgy of our deposits by looking at it that way. So one data set, it's the only data set that I've got a hold of that I can present with, is from Prairie Downs. And here uh, we've got 20 out of the 24 elements used in the Osnaka transform. Uh, so we've had to modify the transform by excluding four elements and that's not difficult to do. And I chose 1400 mineralised samples, so they had to be above 1000 zinc or above 1000 lead and lie at least 75 metres downhole so that they're nominally fresh. I tried that with the 20 elements and iron, nickel and cobalt were really causing me more trouble than they were worth. And then I thought about it. In my grand global scheme, I have to include all the elements. But on a single deposit, I don't need to include these elements that are only varying according to lithology. So I also removed iron, nickel and cobalt and use those elements for the Osnaka transform. I took that into iogas and performed the k-means cluster. And all I'm really wanting it to do is go into this new 17 dimensional space and break me out different groups. And of course I tried this with three populations, four, five. Four was the division which gave the most satisfaction. And here are those classes. So you can see that I'm getting nice uh, consistent profiles and so we should. 
we're dealing with mineralisation from just one deposit. But we are starting to see that there is a particularly high lead group. Whoops. There's a particularly high lead group. There's a group with higher antimony than any other. And then this group down here has more, much more tellurium, bismuth and tin. So it is breaking out different signatures. I did exactly the same exercise using just a standard centred log ratio transform to see, well, would this be picked out anyway? And here are the classes according to uh, the centred log ratio transform. So although the colours are the same, the samples are not. These are, these are different groups, or groups according to the centred log ratio transform. And the result here is that they are very, very similar. So I'll show you the four Osnacker classes averaged profiles and then I'm just going to flick backwards and forwards to CLR and what I want you to, well the point I'm trying to make here is that the CLR profiles are not nearly as different and that's what we're trying to do is we're trying to distinguish different types of metal signature. So there's the Osnaka classes and there's the CLR classes. So I would argue that the Osnaka transform has been much more useful to tease out differences in metal signature. We're not talking about ore grade, we're talking about the metal signature. I've done a principal component analysis and it breaks out, uh, again, interesting relationships, a high lead and a high zinc population on principal component too, a high copper. If we use the CLR transform, we get what we would expect if we looked at this system from the outside. We see that yes, Prairie Downs does have a silver, lead, zinc, cadmium, antimony signature and there is a subsidiary moly, tellurium, copper signature but it's not breaking out different signatures within that overall uh, uh, system the way that the Osnaka transform has. But of course, the true test is, is spatially. So what we've done here in LeapFrog is uh, wireframe the four different Osnaka classes. So what we're looking at, for those familiar with Prairie Downs, they'll remember that it's a northwest or southeast striking fault that dips steeply to the north that hosts the, the, the mineralisation with, with a splay to the south. And looking down on that, we can see that the high antimony and the high zinc seem to follow each other around wherever we go. But an even better view is to look in long section and we see again that the blue and the red, those two domains are intimately associated but the, the high tellurium bismuth tin is sort of around the edges which is the opposite of what I would have thought. I would have thought there would be a, a hot uh, knot of that style of mineralisation maybe deeper down in the system but, but not so. And our high lead uh, signature is almost exclusively up at the, the northern end of the deposit. Now it's a very quick exercise we've done there. It hasn't been uh, constrained by going back to the core and seeing what this actually really means. But I think in principle, that's what I'm really trying to get across the message is that there's a new approach here which we could use to get a hell of a lot more out of our ore deposit geochemistry where very often we, we are collecting data sets where we've got enough elements to do this. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Questions for Tom? Uh, you talked about uh, ore samples. Uh, have you 